Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 823. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 26th, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're we'll going right through September. October's around the corner. We got news for you. If you hear little taps in the background, that's because there's raindrops falling on Sasquatch. Uh, it's wonderful to live in an RV, travel in the RV, but at a certain point you have to recognize uh, you will hear things you don't hear in a normal studio or home, and that's raindrops. When it rains, we hear it. If it gets really bad and George is talking, I'll push the mute button so you don't have to suffer through it. But a lot of people re replied uh, when we did a more of a raw episode a couple weeks ago, they like having the background noise, so great. Let's see what happens. And Kevin, when you get home, we'll have woodpeckers in the background. And, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> Snakes and alligators and everything else. Uh, George, how are you doing this week? I'm tired. Uh, had an emotional weekend. Uh, something happened with my daughter that uh, has, uh, well, you know, I still pay her car insurance and have her <laughs> rent. So in some respects, she's still my baby, but yeah. she uh, she's a nurse. Mm -hmm. She was driving from uh, Seattle down home to San Francisco after having spent the weekend with her sister. And uh, she was on the California Coast Highway. I think it's 101. And she saw a, uh, a driver run over two hikers along the side of the road and take off, leave them by the side of the road. Laura pulled over and uh, uh, assessed the situation, called 911, and the dispatcher said it would be about a half hour, 40 minutes before an ambulance could get there, but the state patrol would be there. And Laura basically did triage, and the woman was okay. She was just hysterical, but the man had a badly broken arm where every time the heart pumped, the blood would shoot out from the broken arm which was like the broken off arm and he had severe uh bleeding and so she put a tourniquet on and she did cpr to keep his heart moving and then uh when the highway patrol officer got there and after he learned that she was a licensed nurse in california they would take turns doing cpr and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and she was trying to and when she wasn't pumping on his chest or breathing into his mouth. She was trying to comfort the wife to calm down. He, we'll, we'll get there. The ambulance is getting there. He's still alive. But Laura knew he was going to die. It was just apparent to her that the injuries were so traumatic. And eventually, he uh, the ambulance did get there, but he did die on the high side of the highway there. And for Laura, it was the calls to me, Daddy, I could have saved him if I only had the right equipment. Daddy, why did God let this happen? And I've been telling my daughter and talking to her over fits and starts. You know, you need her to opportunity for her to vocalize what she's feeling, the trauma and the stress of the the incident. But also say to her, you know, Bunny, God was present. He was present there with you. As this man lay dying, you were by his side, giving him CPR, giving him mouth to mouth resuscitation, comforting his wife, praying with him. And, you know, God didn't cause this drunk to hit this guy. Guy was arrested, uh, found to be drunk. Uh, so he's going to go away for vehicular homicide. But God didn't cause this. But God certainly caused you to be present and be there. And these are fun little illustrations for sermons, but I don't want them to be about my family, okay? I'd rather I talk about your kids, Kevin, or somebody else's kids who've experienced this, not my own, so... It's a tough world out there, but uh, praise God, he uses people for his glory, even in terrible situations. No, I mean, it, that's one of the, the most difficult things younger generations understand. Uh, we understand it because we came from a greater generation that knew where God was in most situations. Mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to show this generation God is present always. And he's here in these little situations uh, where you find yourself in an absolute, you know, uh, pre-PTSD moment. This is going to be with you for a while. I've had a, a friend who uh, accidentally hit somebody. A, a, a kid ran in front of 
uh, her car and um, she hit the kid and that that lasted with her and the kids f- was fine went home that day from the hospital but that moment in time was with her for six seven eight months uh, it, it's very traumatic sometimes I think this my children your children are the child what I call the bike helmet children <laughs> I don't think I ever owned a bike helmet until I'm not a serious biker like you, but when I was a kid, when I was on my Schwinn going around the neighborhood, uh, I had Keds high top sneakers, a t-shirt, pair of jeans. The last thing in the world I would have considered wearing would be a bike helmet, unless I was Mm -hmm. going to go over jumps or something. And I treat my children as if they, I, I use my money, my ability to pay and support them, to give them a better lifestyle is akin to a bike helmet, to protect them from the reality of life around them. Um, now my wife says, you're not going to cut her allowance off. Are you said, no, I'm not going to cut off her allowance, <laughs> but you know, at a certain point she needs to wean off that, uh, but uh, it, yeah. but it, it really is, uh, how should I say it? I mean, praise God, but I'm also surprised that my child was able to act with the foresight and knowledge, forethought and knowledge and in a crisis be effective mm-hmm. um so lots of conflicted thoughts here well we're parents uh you and i raised our kids a little differently uh when it t- came time to 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 send victoria michaela and ben uh, out of the nest we you know we sent them fully out of the nest but we were always a place they could come back if they needed to uh with the expectation they would never need to and they never have your expectation was that you could provide love in your situation uh, physically uh, and financially. And you liked to, to, to keep them. Uh, in, is in a that place why you where, keep asking to be adopted by me, Kevin? So I do. I please adopt your, me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. okay. I want you to play my broken car bills or Sasquatch bills. You know, and I, I, you know, in all my travels, I run into parents, all who raise their kids differently. Um, I had dinner the other night with a, uh, a couple we've known since high school. They are not Christian. They did not raise their kids to be Christian. Their kids know nothing of the faith. Yet they were very respectful. They were very uh, doting on their parents. They didn't have their cell phone out at all, the whole conversation for dinner. Um, and they engaged everybody at the table. And everybody at the table was important to this person. And this person was not raised Christian. And I'm like, oh, you know, I know lots of Christian parents who've raised their children uh, in the faith who don't get that, you know, and <laughs> me sometimes. So, yeah, it, 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 it's it's interesting to watch the dy- dynamics of one family uh, kid, uh, one child families, and five child families. You know, they're they're all different. And our audience knows that because in our audience, there's people who were never able to have kids, and there's people who have eight, seven, nine, eight, seven, seven, eight, nine children, you know. So, at while this is going on with Baby A, mm-hmm. Baby B, who's the union organizer, her union has lent her to the UAW. So she has sent me these little pictures of her with a bullhorn outside a Washington State Assembly factory for Ford. <laughs> no justice, no peace. Strike, strike. Oh my. You know. Well, okay. Uh, this is inside, inside uh, uh, Kevin George baseball. We're going to Pittsburgh this week to see my children. All, all three of my kids migrated from Connecticut to Pittsburgh. They, that's where they have their careers. Uh, first daughter is too busy. She can't see us. Uh, second daughter wants to see us and would love to talk politics and religion until we agree with her. Uh, third son uh, sent us a text. I don't want to talk politics and religion, but I want to see you. That's where we are. We don't want to talk about We just want to see you guys. We want to love on you and dote on you and, and be in fellowship with you and, and, and show you unconditional love. And this generation doesn't know what unconditional love is. They only expect conditional love. And they demand you love them because I want you to love me because I'm bi. I want you to love me because we're trans. I want you to love me because I have a rainbow t-shirt. And they don't understand that as a parent, I'm not, we're not in a tribe. We're in a family. 
and I love you unconditionally because my father and my mother loved me unconditionally. I was the Alex P. Keaton of my family and they, uh, my liberal parents just, they, they lo I, we love you, Kevin. And I love my daughters and my son and um, uh, whatever. George, we have done you, you must have we're, been, we're 10 minutes well, in, You George. must have done, well, Gavin, uh, Gavin Ashenton, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, was complaining the other day that his teenage sons are Tucker Carlson and Joe Rogan fans. So, uh, you never know. so poor Gavin Newsom, who is the PC of PC uh, governors, he, he's worried his kids are becoming conservative. Maybe mm -hmm. what goes around comes around. We have a new Alex B. Keaton generation arising. Who knows? Oh, I... I mean, for those who demand not to talk politics, it's great. You know, I in this day and age, I don't want to sit down and talk about what divides us. The, America has suffered greatly for, from uh, politics for, for many gen years, not generations. And we are a divided nation. I don't want to travel all the way to Pittsburgh to spend time with my kids and talk about stuff that divides us. I would be, like to be a family, and that's a uniting factor. You know, uh, our, our poor audience, we're 11 minutes in. I apologize. Sometimes we get off track here. Um, I didn't tell you what I'm doing. I'm in Milton, Wisconsin. We're traveling to uh, Pittsburgh over the next couple of days where we'll be spending time with my family. Uh, George's daughter uh, witnessed and uh, helped save a, uh, some family that was involved in a tragic hit and run. Uh, the man died. And, you know, you and I have seen in our day and age... Uh, over our 50 60 years that tragedies happen and you just no way to really prepare our kids for that except to be with them in the moment you know it, it's hard george let's move on to the oh 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 i went to a wonderful church in minneapolis uh this week i went to church of the cross on sunday where i think it's um uh bishop stuart ruck's brother uh christopher christian uh was the rector there and here's a church full of 20-somethings. The church was 80, 85% full. They filled the balcony with people. The, the, the pews were full. The music was great. The sermon was an amazing sermon. And I, this, you know, the ACNA needs a lot more of these type of churches. It was in a small little neighborhood uh, in Hopkins in Minnesota. And boom, I was I'm very pleased and impressed. And uh, people need to know, you know, both Stuart and uh, his brother have done wonderful ministries. And uh, the, the fruits were there. This church has planted three or four churches. No, 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 Kevin, so, the yeah. fruits were not there mm -hmm. because it is a healthy ACNA congregation. If it were an Episcopal congregation, there would be a bag of mixed fruit and nuts mm -hmm. in the congregation. But, okay. <laughs> this is why my kids don't want to talk politics. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's so great church. If you get a chance, uh, look up uh, Church of the Cross in Minnesota, Minneapolis. Let's move on to the news. I've lost that page. Here's the news page. Um, you sent me a, a list of articles you wanted to talk about last night, and I looked them over. The first one you have titled Being a Woke Racist. That's interesting. Pays in the Church of Wales and Church of England. And it's interesting because. You and I see this in the background where uh, loud, woke people get promoted in churches, whether it be the Episcopal Church or the Church of Wales, George. Well, the Church of Wales has decided that everybody left in their congregations is now going to be made a canon. They basically uh, appointed 12 canons to St. Daniel's Cathedral in uh, Bangor. And I think that's everybody in the Diocese of Bangor, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But... One of the people appointed was a Church of England vicar named Gerald Robinson Brown. Now, some of you may have heard that name. We've done, we've mentioned him in the past in Anglican Inc., Anglican Unscripted, two years ago. A national figure in Britain, Sir Tom Moore, died. Moore was about 100 years old. He had raised about $45 million for charities in the last years of his life and was a well-beloved, non-controversial person who spoke to the best of Britishness, as uh, his theologies would say. Well, Gerald Robinson Brown, who was uh, a contemporary of Calvin Robinson, so don't confuse the two, uh, Gerald Robinson Brown, newly ordained uh, 
diocese, a diocese, diocese of London priest, he uh, goes onto Twitter and says, I'm not going to be applauding Sir Tom Brown. I am going to be uh, avoiding any celebration of this man's life because he's a symbol of white British nationalism. And this was just a bit too much, you know. And, oh, by the way, Gerald Ga uh, Robinson Brown is gay, out and proud. He's here. He's queer. Uh, no bones about it. And this is when uh, Calvin Robinson is being torpedoed by the Bishop Mullally because he's a black conservative who doesn't believe in institutional racism in the Church of England. Gerald Robinson Brown, who is gay, uh, he'll tell you. He's gay. Did I mention that? Uh, <laughs> Think I just not vegetarian? And, he's, and, and did I mention that he's also black? He's gay and black and black and gay. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. what what he's like? Well, he's on Twitter being, too. Knows, <laughs> yes, but and he's on Twitter. Well, he is. Uh, he gets lauded. He gets slapped down. Oh, don't be mean. Okay. Two years later, his star continues to shine. He's appointed two years into being a you know a priest after having committed one of the major social faux pas of the year and peeing on it from a great height, Sir Tom Moore, he's made canon preacher of St. Daniel's Cathedral. And the Archbishop of Wales, Andy John, who's a bit of a prat, if you ask me, um, says, isn't it wonderful? We now have our first black gay canon in the Church of Wales. Nothing about this guy's merit. Nothing about this man's holiness. Nothing about his connectedness to the divine or God. But we're going to raise him up because he's a racist black gay woke priest and that's the future for the church in wales that's how we're going to get people back into congregations if it, if kevin you can't write satire like this because no one would believe it it wouldn't be funny yeah. but this is the reality that we're in now yeah. um people we published the story without comment on the church on the anglican inc website and some people got all twisted in a knot over his being gay or not. And that's not the point. The point, because there are plenty of gay clergy in the church in Wales. That's not a first by any means. There's one gay lesbian partnered bishop in the church of Wales that I'm aware of. Um, but the point is that this man is extraordinarily unimpressive. He's just... Well, but he makes up for that by virtue... He makes up for that by virtue signaling. Okay, mm -hmm. you can be unimpressive, you can be uh, an enemy of the gospel, an enemy of Christ, and still get promoted in the Church of Wales, Church of England, the Episcopal Church, by being a virtual signaler. Yes. Okay. The culture in which he has found himself rewards people like him, and but then it seeks to destroy people like Calvin Robbins. Mm -hmm. And I, this, the contrast cannot be any starker between... Uh, the two, the, the the two, the fork in the road. All whatever analogies you want to make or similes you want to make, uh, it's there. It's there, is right. Um, let's move on. Uh, I had interviewed uh, Isabel von Spruce uh, for Anglican Unscripted many months ago. She was the uh, uh, layperson who was silently praying outside an abortion clinic in the UK. Was arrested and charged. It looks like the latest story, and it's hard to tell because everything changes so frequently in the news over in the UK, that all charges have been dropped for the silent prey error. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Isabel Vaughn Spruce was arrested by the Birmingham police for praying outside of an abortion clinic. Because her silent, it wasn't that she was there with the bullhorn and haranguing people saying, sinner, you're going to hell. <laughs> Even though they were, uh, it wasn't she was doing that. She was silently praying for those who were going to seek an abortion, that they would change their mind, that Christ's light and love would come into their hearts. She's arrested for the crime of thought, a thought crime of mm -hmm. silent prayer. And the charges were enforced. Then the charges were dropped. Then the charges were reintroduced. And then Suella Race, recently the uh, Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, said, you know, we're not going to be, I'm telling the Crown Prosecution Service, you're not going to be prosecuting these cases. You know, we don't prosecute thought crimes in Britain yet. Uh, 
And so the Crown Prosecution Service dropped the case. But then the Birmingham police said, oh, we're not dropping it. Until finally, the Birmingham police said, okay, I guess we're going to drop it. Now, what's going on here? This, we have this in the United States called lawfare. Uh, you don't like somebody, uh, but you can't beat them fair and square. You keep bringing them back to court until they go bankrupt paying lawyers. This is what the Birmingham police are doing. The Crown Prosecution Service won't touch this case, but the Birmingham police were still pursuing it as a criminal inquiry. You know, this is har this is harassment designed to wear down the other side. Yeah, and one of the biggest problems is Britain, uh, the UK, has different freedom of speech laws than we have. Uh, there are many people who are detained in question, some uh, arrested. Uh, the numbers fluctuate because nobody wants to to, uh, to admit what the real numbers are. I've seen up to 3,000. I've seen as many as 52. You'll, you'll never know because they don't have to tell you who's been detained. They don't have to tell you who's been questioned on the street. Uh, have been uh, questioned over small little things like this because there's just no freedom of speech there. If somebody has been offended and uh, they claim that you offended them, you will be questioned by uh, the police. Uh, there's people on Facebook that I'm friends with who've been questioned, detained, had their uh, iPads and iPhones and uh, computers searched by the police because they had offended people in the uh, LGTBQ community plus. 2Q. I don't, I don't know what it is in it. So. What, what gets me is that uh, we've, now, we've now seen Parliament in England mm -hmm. succumb totally to the cancel culture, it's basically buy into this fascist hate world. And I'm thinking, of course, of the Russell Brand controversy. Mm -hmm. Russell Brand, uh, I don't know whether it's true or not that 20 years ago he did some bad thing. He pressured women into having sex. I don't know. I've never thought he was funny. He's not my cup of tea. I, yeah, I, I, I do not I, enjoy I, his politics or his candor. <laughs> but in the recent years, he has basically become a libertarian from having been on the hard left. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he is being attacked and now accused of historic sex crimes, which are being investigated not by the police but by the media. And then the first thing out of the bat is that YouTube demonetizes him. And then the uh, 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 a British MP, head of the communications media, whatever it is in parliament that handles this stuff, urges uh, Rumble and uh, Twitter and Facebook and all these things to, to basically no trial, no investigation by competent authorities, just accusations, and the wokesters in the uh, uh, parliament, conservative MPs, are saying we have to cancel Russell Brand. And there's no, no there's no, th <laughs> these people should hang their heads in shame. And of course, the Church of England, when it has a chance to stand for what is right and true, not his behavior, but on a pr point of principle, that you're innocent until proven guilty, and you don't have the punishment before you have the trial. Church of England, of course, has got nothing to say on this. I don't know if Britain has that rule, though. Are you what? innocent until proven guilty in uh, the UK? I know we have that here in yeah. America. Well, we got our legal system from the English. We, we don't, got much we of it. it yeah, from, but I, we didn't I, get it from the French. Yeah. We didn't get it from I, the French, which is you're guilty unless you can prove yourself innocent. Yeah. But no, we the Anglo American. That's why we call it Anglo American jurisprudence. <laughs> okay. Uh, but but the reality is has been that. The current elites are so corrupt, are in so far past any semblance of leadership that they just engage in the latest round of, pi of pylon. And, you know, and it's so stupid, like Burger King has now uh, basically uh, joined the anti-Russell brand crusade. What the excuse, excuse my language. <laughs> what is Burger King... You know, here we have two Burger Kings in this county, one over there and one over there. And Bubba and Louie are, you know, flipping hamburgers to rare right now. And their parent company, wherever it is, Chicago, I think, no, it's McDonald's. Their parent company is piling on Russell Brand. 
you got to wonder what these woke companies have. They certainly what they have, whether their profit motive is no longer relevant to these companies. Well, here, okay, here's an example of profit motive. Um, here in America, we have a large pharmaceutical uh, dispensary called CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, Walmart does some, Amazon does some. CVS uh, has to, decided to close 900 stores across America because, and they, they list it, uh, shoplifting. We can't have stores open where people are allowed to come in and take our product, take our merchandise, leave the store without paying. When we call the police, the police will not arrest them. If they are arrested, it's a no-cash bond, no-cash bail. They can get out uh, just by signing a piece of paper. So if you don't have accountability in your community, you will not have a CVS store. Uh, Rite Aid is going out of business because it's being sued uh, for its mismanagement or whatever of oxycodone uh, 20 years ago. And so here in America, we're going to be just forced to get our pharmaceuticals online. I can now go to Amazon and get what I want delivered to me uh, to a certain degree. Uh, where I used to go to CVS, that was my my major supplier for my statin and my uh, my baby aspirin. Now, now George, I'm, I I may never walk again. Well, yeah. well, Kevin, it's it's localized. I doubt a single CVS will close in Florida. I probably um, yeah. Yeah. And that it the joke in Florida is that every third intersection, you've got a CVS on one corner and a Walgreens and do- across the street. Dollar Tree. Dollar Tree. And, and Dollar Tree. Plus, <laughs> plus, uh, uh, yeah. But the, uh, what's happening in California, in Seattle, in Chicago, in Minneapolis, in these cities where the, uh, the elected officials have decided that, uh, enforcement of existing laws is not something they can be bothered to do, but we have to allow people to steal because they need to steal, you're going to see. These things happen. There's a strike currently going on in uh, Oakland. Now, my daughter's not involved, and it's not with the UAW or anything. Rather, local, 100 local shopkeepers have gone on strike and will not open their doors because of the rampant crime mm-hmm. and the police. And it's not the police's fault because basically the prosecutors, they'll arrest these people and the prosecutors kick him out. And so the police say, basically, you know, what is, is it worth my time to do all this paperwork or, you know, and we, you get the government you deserve. Okay. And perhaps I'm sounding a little Calvinist here, but man, the people in California really must deserve (laughs) for the gut, for the mayor and the governors they've got there. Uh, and America deserves it too. Uh, ever since a certain Supreme Court decision in 2015, you can look it up yourself. Um, let's move on to the news now. Hey, George, what do Jimmy Carter and the Episcopal Church have in common? A malaise. A malaise. They're both on hospice care. Oh, that's My- right. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, I, I, Kevin, I was just thinking about Jimmy Carter's. You know. Malay's speech, and I just okay, thought of the Episcopal Church when I, I heard that. But what do you think? So, we're doing a story uh, with Archbishop, uh, pr- uh, uh, Presiding Bishop Michael Curry. I asked that my audience pray for him. We pray for those who are sick. He's currently still in the hospital. He had some major surgery done, um, but he had a Zoom call with the College of Bishops, and he said, to his credit, things are bad. We're, you know, And things are not getting better. Everything we have done has not worked. Let's do it more. George. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it was a, we can look at it as a glass half full, glass half empty. He realizes <laughs> that it's a bad situation. Yeah. Uh, day before his operation to renew, remove, I believe it was a tumor on one of his adrenal glands. Yeah. And he, that was, surgery was successful. He, uh, He's in his late 60s, so any major in surgery is a big deal for a person of that age. Uh, he's in the step-down unit right now. May have been depressed before the surgery, may have been thinking about life and his career and what he accomplished. But he told the House of Bishops via Zoom, we're in trouble. Attendance is not picking up post-COVID. We can jumble, because we, we reported on the uh, 
2022 numbers last week and uh, talked about uh, Jeff Walton's article on the Episcopal numbers and attendance. And Michael Curry did not adopt the uh, peace, did not the party line as saying, oh, well, things are only getting better next year in Jerusalem, all that stuff. No, he basically said attendance is down. Uh, membership is way down. The only thing is holding steady is money. And that's something that's never really worried Episcopalians because, you know, our kids are all grown and left the house. So we have more disposable <laughs> income than average. And Michael Curry is saying, you know, we've got to turn things around. Things have to change. So that was the good side. And then the bad side is, well, let's keep doing what we're doing, but do more of it. Mm -hmm. Let's be even more woke. Let's be even more PC. Let's be even more a creature of the culture. So he realizes that there's a problem. Good for him. But he doesn't realize the solution, uh, which I think is apparent to you and me. Well, yeah, Faith I mean, in Mr. Christ. Well, no, repentance. Repentance. The, 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 the general, the college of bishops and the uh, general convention of the Episcopal Church needs to have a mass repentance. What you have done has destroyed the church. You need to return to the faith, reverse your course, and seek Christ, not uh, popularity, not virtue signaling, not all the things you've sought over the last you know, two decades. It hasn't worked. And it's not going to work for the Church of Wales. It's not going to work for anyone who walks away from Christ. Um, and... You know, part of me says, oh, I hope they just crash and burn, and this is over soon. Um, some people have given a definite date when the Episcopal Church will be over, um, using statistics and demographics and mathematics. And part of me says, well, the, the greatest representation of who Christ is within this would be for the church to repent, would be for the church to turn around, to see that they had walked away from the faith. That would be the greatest uh, way to to resolve this, not to close down. So that's just Kevin's little opinion. Um, George, let's talk about moral duties. Um, every once in a while, the Pope will give a press re release or do a little conference and he'll say it's a moral duty to do this, it's a moral duty to do that. And he's been getting a little bit more uh, woke as time goes on, as we've discussed here in the program. We have a story you want to talk about from the Bishop of Norwich, Graham Usher, who says it is a moral duty to back net zero policies in the church and the government. Hmm. Well, Kevin, I am that most heinous, heinous of all creatures, a climate denier. I do not have a uh, picture of Al Gore on my wall. I do not worry about global cooling or global warming. Um, I wish it were cooler. It's still hot here in Florida. It's, it's the 90s right now. Uh, but the greenie weenies have, the Church of England and the Episcopal Church have adopted the faith of St. Greta, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, not of Jesus Christ. Okay, what's going on here? Uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Britain, uh, year or so ago announced that uh, we're going to be carbon neutral and we're going to get rid of petroleum uh, cars by 2030, I think it was. And we're going to have, uh, uh, we're going to power Britain and get it off of its addiction to fossil fuels. And we're going to power it with turbines and unicorn farts and pixie dust and fairy wings. We're going to do something. We're going to basically live in a fantasy world and we're going to be carbon neutral, meaning we're going to get rid of carbon fuels, even though Britain started off the Industrial Revolution because the carbon was in the coals in the north and it has plenty of oil in the North Sea, we're still going to get rid of all this stuff and go green and have electric cars and have windmills. And he realized the prime minister that this is not 2030 is not going to make it. Okay, we're going to push it to 2035. Well, the Church of England said, I'm glad that Bishop uh, Usher, as a spokesman for the Church of England on the environment, said we shouldn't give up because it's a moral duty to be carbon neutral. 
Now, if you ask Bishop Usher to think through his thought processes and get past the cant and the claptrap and the guardian talking points, he's telling us it's a moral duty to have children in the Congo mine lithium at the age of eight. It's a moral duty to forever keep the people of Mozambique with their huge national gas resources that have just been discovered. And that's why ISIS is active in the northern Mozambique, because they want to control that. It, it, is, it is vital to the world's interest that the poor remain poor so that there are no fossil fuels, no industrial revolution, no lifting people out of poverty so that we can have middle-class Britons and Americans drive their Teslas and feel good about themselves and virtue signal. Um, electric, you know, the British government is telling Nigeria, you should have electric cars. Kevin, their electrical network doesn't work on the best of days. <laughs> and they're one of the major oil producers of the world, and they're telling Nigeria to start subsidizing electric charging stations for Teslas. Mm -hmm. God bless you, Elon Musk. You've got people buying a bill of goods. Good for you. You're doing your job as a salesman, but we don't need our governments, and we certainly don't need the church backing an absolutely idiotic worldview of climate change. No, uh, Elon Musk... Uh you know, obviously a genius at uh, industry and making things, started PayPal and uh, others, ha to buy the lowest, cheapest uh, Tesla, which is 39000 US dollars, to make it carbon neutral, you have to drive it 109,000 miles before the carbon neutral of making the car pays off in carbon neutral neutrality making of the battery of the the carbon and aluminum and the structures inside none of that is carbon neutral you had to manufacture a car and if you do the math you have to drive it 109,000 miles before what they're advertising now this first carbon neutral car is truly carbon neutral and paid off that's 109,000 miles of plugging it into chargers here in America which are largely supported uh, still by coal and uh, nuclear power plants. We, we don't. We don't have the the solar structure of one country in the UK. Uh, is it Scotland who is mostly uh, solar and, and wind? Uh, I just drove no, through Minnesota. No, Scotland is mostly unicorn farts are unicorn powering farts. their energy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but my my point is that I have no. You know, if you want to be green, go green. If you want to be a vegetarian, okay. be a vegetarian. I mean, my. Over, if you've been a long-term viewer of Anglican Unscripted, you've heard the horrors of tofu turkey tofu when my children turkey. were vegans in college. <laughs> Thank goodness they've passed out they of that They've done, yes. But uh -huh. when you start calling this sort of thing a moral duty, and you forget your moral duty to proclaim the gospel, to teach the faith of Jesus Christ, to repent, to get right with God, when you make third-rate political... Uh, platforms, moral duties, you are abusing your authority as a priest, as a bishop, as a spokesman, as someone commissioned to share the good news of Jesus Christ. What um, you, it's yeah. just offensive to me when you get people who are doing their best. I mean, you couldn't do a better job of trying to destroy the Church of England and the bishops of the Church of England are doing right now. And then they come out with this nonsense about moral duties. I mean, when they they're so past the current thinking of bill gates was on the tv good old bill gates he's still, he's thinking this climate change bit is overblown bill gates has now jumped off the climate change bandwagon elon musk has jumped off the climate change bandwagon all the people who the smart people say we must be like oh did i say that well we're now saying something different but the it, church of england because it doesn't stand for anything, it's got to stand for something, so it's going to be climate change. It, it is interesting. More and more scientists are doing what you know Elon did and Gates did, and Kevin never got on the bandwagon. Um, yes, does the climate change? Absolutely. It's changed since the day, many, many eons ago, that God said, let there be light. You know, that, that added to uh, a change in the climate. And 
it, when you look at, you know, we, we've done those ice studies. We go out to the Arctic and the Antarctic. We stick a pole into the ice and go down 10,000 years, so to speak, pull it up. And in 10,000 years of, of climate, we're in the middle. Where, where in 10,000 years do you pick uh, 78 degrees uh, Fahrenheit to be the perfect summer temperature? Where? Where? In 10,000 years, we don't even come close. We're coming off a, a glacial period. We're still coming off that glacial period where uh, America had uh, four major glaciers that uh, occupied us. Uh, we would There would be no Native Americans here in uh, the Americas had there not been glaciers so they could walk over uh, the Russian uh, Straits landmass, the, the Brat Straits. I don't get people, but... Uh, but there's money to be made uh, here in virtue signaling and in fear. There's money to be made, and climate has figured out how to do that. Again, uh, for those who are perpetually aggrieved, I've given them enough to be aggrieved about this morning. Yeah. yeah. But the, <laughs> I'm not. I, you believe what you want about mm -hmm. the environment, and you live your life accordingly. But when you start tossing around terms like moral duty, and it's God's will. Then you are stepping past the point of uh, that you're going to get your nose bloodied by people who know what they're talking about. And the Bishop of Norwich doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, no, because the Church of England and the Church of Wales has been uh, gospel zero for so long. Net zero mm -hmm. is just the next step. They have nothing to do. They're not interested in, in bringing people to a faith in Christ. They're not interested in growing the church. They're not interested in increasing their baptisms. They're not into, it, there's no interest in that. There is an interest in making the news. How can I, as a bishop, be relevant today? I can be relevant by virtue signaling, and they do that. And we see that in the Roman Catholic Church. We see that in the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church. Uh, any denomination here in America wants to be relevant, and they do that by wearing the rainbow. I want to just go off script for a second. Sure. because We don't I, have a script. It, the, go off our list of stories. <laughs> okay. Uh, a, an acquaintance from the Prayer Book Society of Canada sent us, say, a review of a book, the bo memoir of Harold Nutter, the former Bishop of Fredericton and Metropolitan of the Province of Canada, Anglican Church of Canada. And Bishop Nutter... Archbishop Nutter was the last, if you will, of the old time traditionalist bishops. And part of the part of the book review of his life was the absolute total change of the place of the church and of the bishop in Canadian society. Uh, when uh, Archbishop Ramsey came to, I think it was Fredericton or someplace for a synod meeting, uh, the governor political leaders, religious leaders, state leaders came. Um, it was a big deal uh, to call, for political leaders to go to the Anglican Church of Canada Synod and listen to what they had to say and to be informed. Bishop Nutter was given, Nutter was encouraged to stand for election to be Lieutenant Governor of uh, New Brunswick. He was awarded the Order of Canada. This is all in the 60s and 70s. The place of the bishop as a spokes as a figure of intellectual, moral, and social conscience in Canada and in the United States at that time too was tremendous. Nowadays, in the true in the Trudeau II era of Canada, who gives a hoot about what any bishop says or does? Has any politician shown up at the last Canadian Synod meeting to uh, basically connect with the people there. It's just times have so changed and the church and its bishops have thrown away their relevance. Their relevance. Yeah, absolutely. But let's, con oh, here, let's contrast this. Uh, timeline, Nigeria. Uh, in our next story, we're going to talk about the Archbishop of Nigeria and some interesting things. In Nigeria, the bishops and archbishops are still relevant and, and have uh, still some political power. Now, there's some corruption and some uh, fancy stuff that should be happening in, in the church in Nigeria that people are becoming aware of, thanks to the news media and stuff like that. But Nigeria is trying to do what it can to stamp that out. Nigeria, 
uh, and our next story, let's see here, dissolves its North American diocese. They will become missionary districts after an accord reached with the ACNA. Well, okay, so much for that blogger story. Um, let's talk about this because there's a follow-up story to this we'll talk about in a second, but this is big news. You and I have discussed at length, at nauseum, uh, kind of the what we would call the meddling of Nigeria into uh, the ACNA province. You know, why don't the Nigerians pull back? Uh, um, Akinola promised that uh, all this would be temporary when he formed dioceses over here for the Americans to have some security in. And he, you know, Akinola said, listen, when there's a, a province in America that's uh, sustainable, like the ACNA, uh, Nigeria will gladly pull back. The new leadership in the uh, uh, Nigeria didn't do that. They planted more dioceses and, and were doing what we call border crossing. Now, well, we're stepping back and you look at the big picture, hands off from a, the Nigerians, frontiersmen, George. That's amazing. Yeah, the recent sent gen, 14th General Center, the Church of Nigeria met, and some of the initial statements that came out were woefully misinterpreted mm -hmm. because the Archbishop, uh, Henry Ndekuba, said, we will continue to support the Nigerian diaspora around the world with ministry and support. So the church is not going to abandon you if you move to England, Canada, Australia, right. America. And this was interpreted that uh, we're going to continue to add bishops, add dioceses, thumb our noses at the church in the ground. Well, in uh, England, the church in the ground doesn't care about the church in Nigeria. And so they're at open war. But in the United States, there was disquiet because Peter Akinola, who originally helped form the Nigerian presence of the United States institutionally, wanted it to be handed over to the new ACNA. And it has been in drips and drabs. Most recently, Felix Orji mm -hmm. took his diocese of the West. Is that what? I'm sorry. One of them, yeah. Just it's, a blank. It's, it's, yeah I just drew a blank on his diocese. He <laughs> took his diocese fully into the ACNA released in good standing and good odor with the Church of Nigeria, uh, leaving only two Nigerian dioceses with uh, two bishops and about four, three, four suffragans. And the initial reaction was, well, they, these guys are just going to keep multiplying more Nigerian bishops, more this and that. Well, Pete, uh, Henry Ndekuba put out a statement saying, no, this is what I mean by this. And this is what the Synod and the uh, decided. We are going to dissolve our Nigerian bishop diocese, the two that we have left. They are going to be missionary districts. Now, the bishops who are there already will be missionary bishops to these to these chaplaincies, if you will. Mm -hmm. But we are not going to create parallel ecclesial structures on the ground in North America. Now, behind the scenes, I assume there has been some conversation about what is the exact relationship between the ACNA and the Church of Nigeria, and they kept a good job keeping it quiet because I wasn't uh, hearing anything. Well, we I heard stuff from you know eight, twelve months ago where uh, they were all in a room and you didn't want to go in that room. It was very tense, and uh, Archbishop Foley certainly expressed his opinion, and so did the Archbishop of Nigeria. Uh, it seems that we've come to an accord. Uh, we've resolved the situation where Nigeria has stopped building kingdoms over here uh, in this province and is going to support uh, missionary districts here, which is good. And remember, it's important that people's face be saved. What do I mean by that? Mm, that it's true. somebody can't just get up and say, ha, 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 you were wrong all the time and now I'm right. Uh, rather, a graceful exit had to be created and time allowed and space allowed so that it would seem a natural progression for the church of Nigeria to make this step rather than to be bullied by the ACNA into doing it. Mm -hmm. Because the bullying of the West of Nigeria has been a major issue in Nigeria. And if the ACNA thought that they could just say, you do what we say to Nigeria, that wasn't going to happen. But if they allow the church of Nigeria to know their concerns, and not insist upon only one answer, but allow Nigeria to work itself forward, then you get to this good result. In politics so and war, yeah. 
I mean, I have to give credit to uh, Archbishop Beach and uh, Henry Indicuba, and I don't know the team who was involved, but certainly there was a team, and they've been able to come up with a really good solution. Yeah. In politics and war, we call it an exit, an exit ramp. How do we get out of the situation? We need an exit ramp. Uh, they were talking early on between Russia and Ukraine. Russia needs an exit ramp. Uh, Ukraine needs an exit ramp. NATO needs an exit ramp. Well, how do we get out of the situation? It still remains. But I introduced this about the power of the archbishop and uh, an archbishop who is still relevant. And the archbishop in Nigeria is still relevant, so much so that he's calling for uh, changing teams, George. This is uh, an article that has gone over the heads of many people or gone by their notice but it is a to my mind tremendous significance the archbishop of nigeria at the general synod basically called as you said for nigeria to switch sides mm -hmm. join BRICS. now what is BRICS? BRICS is a rising alternative to the u.s global currency movement the petrodollar the Bretton Woods economic system. 1944, Bretton Woods set the dollars, the, basically the standard for the world economy. Right. And now we're gone, uh, what is that, 75, almost 75, 80 years later, that Russia, China, India, Brazil, and South Africa are saying, no, we don't want to pay everybody in dollars. We want to use our own currencies. We want to pay yuan and rubles and rupees. And so from an economic perspective, removing the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency will basically hammer you and me financially in this country and all Americans whose lives are dollar denominated. Our mortgages will get more expensive. Our purchasing power will decrease. We have allowed the, the global economic system has propped up the American standard of living. Now, the BRICS is going to take that away. It wants to challenge that. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, all the people are saying, oh, we must kick Russia out of the SWIFT banking network because of their invasion of Ukraine, which we did. The U.S. did. Well, Russia set up an alternative SWIFT network through the BRICS network. So now Russia's economy is in better shape now than it was before they invaded Ukraine. And Henry Indicuba said, we need to get out from underneath the British and the Americans economically and culturally and politically. So let's throw a lot in with the Russians and the Chinese. So who's he talking about? He's talking about Joe Biden and Justin Welby and Boris Johnson and uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron in France. And what he is saying is that, look, our economies are being dictated to us by London and Washington. And at the same time, they're giving us social teachings, how we must behave. We must accept this, the latest gay, transgender stuff. We well, must accept that if we want aid. All or, money comes with strings. Yes. Every, every dollar from America or uh, Europe comes with strings. And the, uh, and the, and the, and the, the, the Nigerians are thinking, you know, if we're going to take strings, Let's take it from the Russians who are on the same moral plane as we are. They're just as conservative as we are on some of the issues that divide us from the Americans, same-sex marriage, the transgender issue, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, the woke culture. Russia is totally anti-woke. And with the Chinese, we know they're crooks, but they don't make any bones about it. So basically, so long as we keep our eyes open from the beginning yeah, and know that they're going to try to steal, let's not worry about it. But the Americans and the British who come in so pious and wonderful, here's our money, we want to help your poor. And oh, by the way, totally retransfigure and reorder your economy, your culture, and do what we say. And uh, oh, by the way, we want you to invade Niger uh, for Emmanuel Macron and put back <laughs> in power the French puppet. Zimbabwe. Because, <laughs> yeah. the, because we're... Uh, we don't want to send a British or American or French troops into that mess, but you send Nigerian troops and do us a favor. And besides, we'll pay you to do it. And the, Niger and the Archbishop of Nigeria is saying, no, it's better to be in bed with the Chinese uh, and the Russians than it is to be in bed with the Americans politically and economically right now and the British. Well, now, Chinese money and Russian money come with strings. I just think the Archbishop thinks that those strings are less of a hassle than uh, uh, sexual identity politics strings. 
Yeah, because there's no, you know, Justin Welby is a member of the World Economic Forum. He's in he's in all these global wokester institutions, mm -hmm. and he's the one that oh you're so mean and terrible for having these anti-gay laws and this and that. And the Nigerians sit down and say, you just had tea at Lambeth Palace with mullahs from Iran who want to destroy Israel, mm -hmm. who call for the killing of gays by tossing them off the tops of buildings. You call these people your friends. You treat us, who are Anglicans, like dirt and tell us how to live and how to think and how to behave. You've got a colonial heritage that, you know, basically you ruled us for 100 plus years and you still haven't let go, even though you pretend to have. Man, why don't we just rip up everything and start afresh with the Russians? Mm -hmm. Who Now, why is this happening? Well, because we have a feckless idiot in Lambeth Palace and a feckless idiot in Washington. Excuse my language. Well, I mean, yes, it, it, and, and at uh, uh, 812. But the reasons are beyond that as well, because we as a whole Western society have decided we're going to use our money as power and influence to make many Americas. Uh, you know, our foreign po policy has always been to, to find a communist country and make it a democracy. Now, that's worked a couple times. You know, we, we were able to, to certainly uh, make... Uh, East Germany, a, a unified Germany and stuff like that. But in most places, that policy of making another democracy has not worked when we've done it with our political engagement. Yeah, I mean, we go back to George uh, W. Bush and we're going to make Iraq a little Vermont where we have town hall meetings and the Shias and the Sunnis mm -hmm. and the Christians will all get along in peace, love and happiness. Mm -hmm. And how many millions have died and how many billions have been lost in this fruitless effort? Yeah. Now, and we've discussed this on this program before, Saddam, who dis Saddam Hussein was a despot, absolute murderous to totalitarianism, yet managed to keep the peace in that part of the Middle East, uh, the Iraq area, for many years by being a despot. I'm not here to mm -hmm. support or, oh, Kevin, you support? No, no, I'm just an observationist. He kept the peace. When we took him out, uh, all hell broke loose. And so, you know, uh, we're not really good at, we're very good at advertising the, the benefits of being in a Western culture. Uh, you know, Russia, the Soviet Union wanted everything we had here in America back in the 70s. They loved the jeans. Oh, you guys got blue jeans. You guys got, you guys got cowboy hats. We love that. You guys have Dallas. We love that show. Yeah, we were great at advertising what it meant to be an American, but we ha we have no ability to to make the sale. We can't close that deal. Oh, we'll show up with tanks and guns and we'll make you a democracy. Doesn't work. Does not work. Let's uh, finish up here because we, we got three minutes to, to do one story here. Uh, we'll do the George Bell. We'll save the sole survivor for next week. George Bell saga is over. I have in bold letters on a title from George. Uh oh, you want to talk about something else? He's back, baby. George <laughs> Bell is back. <laughs> He's back. Uh, you say it's over. The good guys won. On Tuesday, there will be a service of Thanksgiving for the life of the despot, Bishop Bell. George Bell is the first a person in the church in this generation modern to have been modern canceled era. in yes. the modern era <laughs> or is it the postmodern era when, whatever era yeah. we're in okay uh, you're in my era kevin you're yes. in my era the kevin and george, george era was the first victim of cancer cancel culture courtesy of martin warner the bishop of chichester and jo and justin welby yeah. for false and fraudulent charges that he abused people well all of that was proven to be false. George Bell was probably the most consequential moral bishop of the 20th century in the Church of England. And I, I think you meant, a, you meant relevant. We're talking about relevant bishop. He was a very relevant bishop who people sought advice from. And he, he ruled with morality. Absolutely. 
George Bell was the one who stood up in Parliament in 1943-44 saying we should not be firebombing the cities of Germany. Yeah. We should be killing, we're destroying the Nazi war machine, but not destroying the homes and lives of innocent German civilians. Yeah. If it's bad for the Germans to do it to us in London and Coventry, it's bad for us to do it in, in Hamburg and London, Berlin. But that being said, he was canceled over false charges that were never fully investigated. Uh, he was a sacrificial victim. Welby and company, Welby who has never apologized or met, Welby who's met with Iranian uh, Shia mullahs, backed mullahs, has still not yet met with John Smith survivors, even though he promised to do that. Welby and Mar Martin Warner sacrificed George Bell as a pawn in the sexual abuse stories to show that the church England was tough, even though this was an innocent man. Mm -hmm. And through the hard work of a cross-section of people, uh, local activists in Chichester, Richard Simmons, not the guy with the no, exercise no, no, no. legs, but, uh, <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, Peter Hitchens, the uh, columnist with the Daily Mail, historians, liberals, and conservatives, they finally basically beat back the assault and Bell, who was erased from his cathedral, has now being recognized once again. He appears on the website, a building that was named after him, after his name plaque was taken down. It's now being put back up on Tuesday of next week. He's going to have an Evensong service uh, on Tuesday, the 3rd of October. And he's back, baby. If Justin Welby has any decency, he will be there at that service. Um, Kevin, you're asking integrity. I ask a lot. I ask you're a lot. asking integrity from somebody. That, that's I, a tough ask. You know, after 823 episodes, I, I demand a lot from my bishops, and that's just life. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and I think I've called five people <laughs> feckless idiots today on Anglican <laughs> Unscripted, episode 823.